This is a Cambridge IGCSE chemistry paper six alternative to practical talk through. The diagram shows the apparatus used to pass an electric current through concentrated hydrochloric acid. Hydrogen and chlorine were formed at the electrodes. Name the item of apparatus labelled A. We're kicking things off nice and straightforwardly. That is just a straightforward beaker. The electrodes are made out of platinum give two reasons why platinum is a suitable material for the electrodes. So these are the electrodes. First of all, you need something which can carry a current. So that's why platinum is good, because of the delocalized electrons. Secondly, you need a really unreactive metal, hence why platinum is a good option. So we're going to say platinum is inert, unreactive. And the second reason for choosing it, it conducts electricity. Suggest another material suitable for use as electrodes in this experiment. The other one we tend to use is graphite, which remember is an allotrope of carbon. The teacher doing this experiment wore safety glasses, gloves, and had their hair tied back and stood up throughout the experiment. State one other safety precaution that should be taken when doing this experiment. Explain your answer. Okay, this is quite hard. Notice, however, that we've got chlorine forming. Now, chlorine is incredibly toxic, which means this experiment should really be carried out in a fume cupboard. Why? Because chlorine is toxic. I soon investigated the rate of reaction between sodium metabisulfite and potassium iodate. In the reaction, starch was used as an indicator at first, the reacting mixture remained colourless, but then suddenly it changed to a blue-black colour. That means that starch is present. Five experiments were done. In each experiment, the total volume of liquid was 45 centimetres cubed. In experiment one, we used a measuring cylinder to measure out 5 centimetres cubed of the sodium metabisulfite. Then we measured out 5 centimetres cubed of aqueous starch. 15 centimetres cubed of distilled water was added and then 20 centimetres cubed of aqueous potassium iodide was added. Then the stop clock was started and the mixture in the beaker was stirred until a sudden colour change was seen. The stop clock was stopped and the time recorded. The beaker was rinsed with water to clean. In experiment two, it's all the same methodology. However, this time we've got 17 centimetres cubed of distilled water, 18 centimetres cubed of potassium iodide, Experiment three, we've increased that distilled water further whilst decreasing the potassium iodate. Experiment four, we see more of the same. And experiment five, all water and very little potassium iodate. So as we go down these experiments, we see more water, less potassium iodate. Make sure you read every word with these questions that will really, really help you. Don't rush. That's my biggest advice. Use the information in the description of the experiments and the stop clock diagrams to complete the time, record the times in seconds. So what is our volume of aqueous sodium metabisulfite? It tells us it's five centimetres cubed and then we're repeating the methodology, which means we can just pop a five don't put units in the main part of your table. That's already included up here. What about the volume of distilled water? In experiment one, we were told it was 15. So there's the 15. What about experiment two? This time it was 17. Experiment three, 21. Experiment 4, 23. Experiment 5, 25. Keep cross-checking this. They filled in the volume of potassium iodate, so we don't need to touch that. What about this time to change colour in seconds? Look at the stop clock diagram. The outer ring represents seconds. The inner ring represents minutes. So whilst that arrow points at zero, we know that there's no complete minutes here. But what about the number of seconds to turn colour? Make sure you count this. It goes from 30 here to 45 there. 
So just count them, 31, 32, 33, etc. And you'll go all the way up to 38 seconds. Now this one, count it round again. Just looking at the seconds, we're just before 45. So count it through from 30. You'll see it's 42. This one took much longer. Count it through. 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53. Now this time we've got at least a minute, a minute and one second. Remember they want the answer in seconds only, so a minute and one second is actually 61 seconds. And here again, a minute and count this round to the number of seconds. That's 12 seconds, so 60 seconds plus 12 is 72 seconds. Plot the results from experiments one to five on the grid and draw a smooth curve of best fit. So they've done the axes for us. We're plotting time to change colour versus the aqueous potassium iodate. So make sure you're looking in the right columns. These are the bits of data we need. So the first reading is 20 and the time is 38. So we've done that one. What about this one, 18 and 42? Now 14 and 53. 12 and 61. 10 and 72. They want a smooth line of best fit, so you have to draw this by hand rather than using a ruler. That's the best I'm going to be able to draw on the iPad. From the graph, predict the time to change colour if 16 centimetres cubed of potassium iodate was used to show clearly on the grid how you worked out your answer. So we draw a line up here at 16 centimetres cubed and then we read across to that y-axis to get a value of around 47 and a half. I'm going to say 47. Okay, the volume of distilled water required if 16 centimetres cubed of aqueous potassium iodate was used. So in order to work this out, remember that these total volumes here didn't change. It was 35 centimetres cubed throughout. So what number do we need to add to 16 to make 35? Well, that's 19 because we need the same volume throughout. Sketch on the grid the graph you'd expect of experiments 1 to 5 were repeated at a higher temperature. So you'd expect the time to change colour to be faster in every single case. So I'll just draw it as a mock-up. It's terribly drawn, but I'm just trying to show here that it would take less time at high temperature due to that increased kinetic energy. The concentration of potassium iodate in the reaction mixture in each experiment can be calculated using this equation. Calculate the concentration of potassium iodate used in the reaction mixture in experiment two. Let's steal that. So what's our volume of potassium iodate in experiment two? Here's experiment two, the volume was 18. Divide that by 45, plug that into your calculator to get a value of 0 0.02. State which experiment one, two, three, four, five had the fastest rate of reaction. It's the one where the time for the color to change was the shortest, which means it's this one at 38 seconds, so that's experiment one. Suggest why the volume of the distilled water added to each experiment was increased as the volume of aqueous potassium iodate was decreased. So obviously it's the potassium iodate that's the interesting reactant here, but you've got to maintain that volume throughout, which was 35 centimetres cubed. So that's why as this value decreased, the distilled water increased to keep the total volume constant. Give one change you can make to the apparatus which would improve the results explain your answer. If you look at this, throughout the whole thing, they constantly mention measuring cylinders, measuring cylinder, measuring cylinder, measuring cylinder, blah, blah, blah. These are a very imprecise piece of measuring apparatus. You want to use a burette or pipette instead. Burettes are more accurate than measuring cylinders. How could the reliability of the results of this investigation be checked? Well, reliability is all to do with repeating 
and calculating an average because it allows you to see if your results are coming up similar every time and allows you to discount anomalous results. Solid Q and solid R were analysed. Solid, solid Q with zinc carbonate tests were done on each solid, complete the expected observations. Solid Q was placed in a boiling tube, 10 centimetres cubed of sulfuric acid was added, any gas produced was tested. So what were your observations? So you've got zinc carbonate, you're adding sulfuric acid, we're going to make a salt, which is zinc sulfate, plus water, plus carbon dioxide. So what would you expect to happen? Well, first of all, there'd be fizzing due to the carbon dioxide be being given off and the zinc carbonate would dissolve or get smaller. But what test do we need to prove that it is carbon dioxide? Well, you'd add gas to lime water, or bubble it over, that'd probably make more sense, which should turn milky. And they have explicitly mentioned that they want a test here. So what is that gas? Well, we've already mentioned it several times. It's carbon dioxide. The reaction mixture from A was filtered. The filtrate was a solution S. One centimetre depth of solution S was poured into a boiling tube. Aqueous sodium hydroxide was added dropwise and then in excess to the boiling tube. What were the observations? What does the Zn2 plus do when it's reacted with sodium hydroxide? Well, it forms a white precipitate, which should dissolve with excess sodium hydroxide and form a colorless solution. Explain why it's not possible to identify the cation containing your solution as from one of your observations in C part one because there are other cations that behave like this, such as aluminium would also produce the same result. Suggest an additional test that can be done on solution S to confirm that the cation was Zn2+. This time you'd want to add excess ammonia as that precipitate Should dissolve if you have zinc. You can write it out in words, by the way, if you're not happy with the formulae. Tests on solid R. Tests were done and the following observations were made. A flame test was done on solid R and you get a yellow flame. That is going to therefore mean that the sodium ions present. Solid R was dissolved in distilled water to produce solution R. The solution was divided into two equal portions in test tubes. For test tube, around one centimetres cubed of dilute nitric acid followed by silver nitrate was added and a yellow precipitate form. So if you're adding nitric acid and then silver nitrate, it means you're testing for group seven, so the halides. And remember, they go white, cream, yellow precipitates based on if it's chloride, bromide or iodide ions because we've got yellow it means it's iodide. Test 3, the second portion of solution I was added to 1 cm cubed of aqueous bromine. Solution changed colour from orange to brown. This is a displacement reaction just proving that the bromine is more reactive than the iodine. So again making us think that we have iodide ions. So what is solid R? Sodium iodide. Brass is a mixture of two metals, copper and zinc. Copper does not react with dilute sulfuric acid. Zinc reacts with hot dilute sulfuric acid to form the soluble salt, zinc sulfate. Plan an investigation to find the percentage by mass of zinc in a sample of brass. In your answer, you should include how to calculate the percentage by mass of zinc. You have access to normal laboratory apparatus. So this isn't as clear cut as, you know, the variable layout 
type of questions. However, let's think about what it is we're after. We're trying to find the percentage by mass of zinc in a sample of brass. And we know that zinc reacts with dilute sulfuric acid in order to form the salt zinc sulfate. So if we can get that zinc in that brass to react to, f to form that zinc sulfate, having measured the mass of brass to begin with, and then measuring the mass of the brass afterwards, then by using the equation, percentage by mass equals mass of zinc divided by the mass of the brass times by 100. So experimentally, how are we going to do that? First of all, measure the mass of brass using a balance. Then we need that zinc to react. So add, let's say, 100 centimetres cubed of hot dilute sulfuric acid. The key thing with the volume of sulfuric acid is you need to force all that zinc to react. So the acid must be in excess. Now, in order to work out your mass of zinc effectively, because your brass is your zinc and the copper. So if you force that zinc to react with the sulfuric acid, what you'll have left, that mass will be the copper and you take that away from the original mass to work out the mass of zinc. But how do you work out the mass of copper? In order to do that, you want to filter the solution, wash and dry the residue, which remember contains the copper, it needs to be dry so you don't have any excess water. Measure the mass of that copper residue and then do mass of zinc. Must therefore be the mass of the original brass minus the mass of copper. And at that point you can substitute those values into this equation here.